Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And today we have something super awesome. We have a guest. We have a guest. It's not just us. <laughs> Other people care about individuation and relationships yes. and love and all that stuff too. And luckily, I know some pretty amazing people in this field. And today this we're going to talk one. to one. We're going to talk to Melissa Height of Higher Sex Education. It's it's awesome. What she's offering is awesome. I'm going to read her bio in a minute. But before that, I wanted to ask you, we did this interview and we're going to talk about boundaries, yeah. but in a different way than we've talked about yeah. them previously. Melissa's going to talk about inner boundary work. And just as your, I want your hot take. Did it, did it hit different for you? It did. It <laughs> did. There was uh, a few completely new ways of thinking about boundaries and myself and uh and some of our experiences i'm not surprised amazing. because yeah. when we talk about boundaries often um we're talking about the stuff that we can see yeah out there right and so melissa is going to talk about some of the stuff that goes on inside yes and she's going to give you some practical ideas about what to do but also um tell you a little bit about her work and yeah. how she can help take boundary work really to the next level. I'm I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Okay. Well, joining us today is Melissa Height, the founder of Higher Sex Education. Uh, Melissa does one-on-one -on -one coaching where she teaches classes and workshops and offers online courses. She's a sexual spiritual advisor, which means that she works holistically with clients to integrate all parts of themselves in practical ways. She is a wealth of wisdom, and this I can absolutely attest to, sure. a wealth of wisdom from a unique blend of life experience and academic education. Not only is she certified as a holistic sexuality educator through the Institute of Sexual Education and Enlightenment, where I also received my training. So having Melissa here, is it reminds me of the fact that putting in this work is so, so worth it. Um, Melissa's though, she's triple certified. She also is a pole fitness instructor, has 15 years of massage therapy experience, specializing in sports therapy and lymphatic, lymphatic therapy. And she's spent years working. She, she has a special, special thing on her bio. She spent 10 years working in Nevada's legal brothel industry. And believe it or not, was trained as a human cannonball with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. I Melissa has done it that. all. She's done that. She's a human cannonball to finish it all off. You're going to love this episode, everyone. And if you have further questions, just know I intend to have Melissa back. So you can email me, Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. If you have questions that you want included in a season five episode. Hi, Melissa. It is so, so good to have you with us. I'm so glad that you wanted to come on and talk about a subject that matters a ton to Ken yeah, and I. Thanks for joining us. We're going to talk about mm -hmm. honoring personal boundaries and how it relates to this, this topic that I harp on about, about individuation and how important it is in relationships. But I just wanted to kick off. Could you tell everybody how you got into this amazing field of relationship work, self-development, sexuality, all of it? Yeah, that's a huge question. It um, is. Take yeah, your thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for having me on. I'm excited to be here and have this conversation. Um, that is a really loaded question. And um, it's hard not to get into like my whole life about that. I kind of feel like my whole life is about this and that I've been preparing my whole life for this. I think a lot of it started with being a child and having my boundaries violated constantly. Um, and growing up and learning to heal that, starting on a healing journey in my early 20s and having really great mentorship and figuring out my own individuation, you know, how to be me. And then um, 
just just a really large healing journey. I got into sex education uh, where I met you at IC back in 2014, yeah, I, I think yeah, is what we I were think it was trying to remember. Yeah. So it's been a long time and you have been very um you've been so vocal about making sure that we take seriously the embodied part of, yes. of sexuality. And that's one of the things that I value so much about your, your education stance. Um, everybody right. comes just differently, but. Right. I, I find that difficult in the academic community, specifically in the sexual academic community, that it's so disembodied and it's, it's just such a disconnect to right. have any kind of understanding of sexuality that's disembodied. It is. And when you um, when you got started in sex education, did you did you see yourself like did it immediately jump out to you that you'd be working with issues like boundaries and self-development? Did you come into it knowing like, OK, I've got to deal with consent and boundaries and all of that right off the bat? Or did that come to you as you were doing the work and you realized, oh, it can't just be about the fun part. I also have to talk about the other underlying structures. Yeah, boundaries has always been a very um, interesting topic to me. I've always had my radar on it. And I, I started to learn over the years that people are, are just focusing on what I call external boundaries rather than the internal portion of boundaries. So the external portion is how we relate to others, the consent, the conversations, our interactions with others, which is great and necessary and beautiful. And I see that we're missing the internal piece of what is my personal truth. What is true to me? How do I navigate my relationship with me? That comes first. And I think we're skipping a step. Yeah. And so I started <laughs> looking at boundaries and thinking like, wow, people aren't getting this. People aren't understanding this. And I, I think I need to talk about this more. Yeah. And boundaries is a buzzword right now. Yeah. I, mean, I think in the last year, I've seen three or four books come out by big authors who've made you know great points. But I think you're right. They're mostly talking about these these external boundaries, as you called mm -hmm. them. And I think that's even, that's where I tend to do my work. And as an extroverted person who naturally looks out a lot, I have to remind myself to do the internal piece. Could you describe to me, like, what is that? Like, what, what does it look like to you to take seriously your internal boundaries? It's getting real intimate and honest with myself and knowing and understanding my personal truth. Mm. That's huge. Yeah. Ken, do you know where your personal truth is? <laughs> <laughs> How does that translate to boundaries? So external boundaries, I think I have a, a sense of, but I'd kind of like to hear you talk about the, the distinction between internal and external. Yeah. Well, the internal aspect is, is my personal truth. It's what is, it's, it's what is true for me. It's what's necessary for me to be in my own integrity. Mm. And that's an evolving process as individuation is that is an ever evolving process. You never reach a final point where you get it. Each yes. moment yeah. is an opportunity for a new boundary to be discovered or changed or whatever needs to happen there. Cause our environment changes all the time, including our internal environment, who we are as a person changes all the time. Right. Right. And so we get to constantly check in with ourselves and ask ourselves these hard questions of how do I feel about this? And is this okay for me now? I said I wanted to do this and now I'm not so sure. Now I kind of feel funny about it. It's about that internal that's, conversation. That, that's a great, um, a great example because I have found myself in situations where, yes, I committed to something or agreed or whatever. And and now I'm in the moment and I'm, I'm not even really talking about sex at this point. It's all kinds mm -hmm. of things where all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, I don't think this works for me now. Oh, well, I, I agreed. And therefore everyone can hold me up against that and say, but you agreed. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're talking about is, yep, I did. But now I'm observing myself and saying, this doesn't work for me now. Right. And feeling the power to say that. So right. um, how do you work with people to help them feel that, 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 that power to claim in the face of social pressure and all that to say, okay, yeah, I, I hear you saying that that's your, your boundary, but you said you're going to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a couple layers to that. Um, how, how to implement that externally 
is one layer, but mm -hmm. we need to go back to the first layer of identifying what that is, even feeling what that truth is. And that comes yeah. from somatic work. And most people are really disconnected somatically. That tends to be the real learning edge is connecting with the information that the body is giving you, connecting with the emotional information. Yeah. And so can you yeah. explain what somatic work is for people? Because we use that word and I've used mm -hmm. the word here on this podcast quite a few times, but we can, I think it's always worth describing what is somatic because it yeah, sounds good, but it's really straightforward when you get down to it, right? Real simple. It's the information from the body. We need to get the body's vote when we make decisions. We tend to just get the, the brain's vote. We tend to just have the thinking mind and we need the body's vote. And the body should that. have the strongest vote. <laughs> the body should have the strongest vote. Yeah. Boom. Wow. Period. End of story. And, <laughs> from, and so if people aren't currently aware of how to get the body's vote, is there some way that you would point them, a direction you might point people to begin gaining somatic awareness? Yeah, there's infinite ways. It's really any way that you are guided to. Your body will tell you, but it's listening to your body. So I just, I wrote a course on um, this internal boundary work and there's activities each week and they're all based around connecting with the body, going for a walk and, and listening to the body's information, doing different meditations, doing different yoga activities or Qigong or whatever it is for you. There really is infinite possibilities on how to connect with your body more but it's taking the time to sit and be aware of sensation. Mm, I do wow. lots of coaching to like, what, what are the sensations happening right now? Like you're stressed about, you're stressed about the job interview, whatever it is. Right. And instead of just thinking about it, sit down and like, how does your chest feel right now? What's yeah. going on in your throat? Is there something in your belly that's happening and just paying attention to it? Yeah. We that's where it starts. We talk all the time about what, managing stressors, managing change, and it is easy to get into a place where you're thinking through all your problems, or you're even just sort of feeling through them, and you're you're swung around by moods, which change very rapidly and are impacted by a lot of external stuff. But the mm -hmm. body is with you all the time. Mm -hmm. You exist as a creature, so it does have. It, there's this ring of deep honesty or integrity mm -hmm. to, the, to the body's information. Yeah. Exactly. For whatever reason, um, hearing this in the context of, so I'm a tech worker, we talked about that, and I spend a lot of time at the computer, so most of my day is very cerebral. Yes. All, like my body has almost nothing to do with it. And I was thinking about the, the course you were describing and how, how much the people in this field need stuff like that because right. day after day i have all kinds we'll of, just sign ken up yeah, yeah that's fine <laughs> and, and i have a lot of distractions during the day that bring me back into my body because yeah, we're working i'm working at home there are people everywhere there's there's surprise interactions with dogs and children and so i i get a little bit back in my body but i remember what it was like when i was in an office all day and i think about the people i work with and that wasn't like that at all it was like there was no body like brains in a jar. I, I would. Yeah. Brains in a jar. I'd walk yeah. in, sit down, get up, go home. And in right. between was all brain work. And I remember you coming home. He would come home from that setting and connecting was almost impossible. Uh -huh. Right. For, oh goodness, an hour and a half, two hours. Really mm -hmm. um, hard to get back. Yeah. Even though that. you are by nature a very sensation, you're a sensei. Very, you're like he's, he yeah. tends to be very in his body, but the job yeah. itself ha had imposed a certain set of habits. So I'm hearing you talk about like tools and like methods to put into action rather than just sort of deciding Ideas of this is easy for me mm -hmm. or it's not easy for me. Like everybody can do this. You don't oh, have absolutely. To kind of we're all, absolutely, we're all in bodies. It's all innate. Yeah. We all understand how to do it, but we're trained. Society trains us to be right. brains in a jar. Yeah. So it's just like, putting more time and energy and attention into, into our bodies. Lovely. <laughs> and what's something that you've gotten out of doing that? Like, how has your life changed? Oh my goodness. And I know that's a million things. So you can pick. Any I really understand. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. A, it's a huge question too. It, I, I really understand. I really get now how honoring myself and honoring my body is the, is the path to my greatest life. 
And when I don't honor myself, when I go against what my personal truth is, I have real strong consequences. I have real bold ramifications for going against myself and my body. When we, when we don't honor our personal truth, we create a distrust with ourself. We chip away at the relationship with ourself. And if our relationship with ourself isn't strong and solid, none of our other relationships are gonna be strong and solid. We can't have intimate relationships that are more connected than our individual relationship. Say that again for people in the back. Yeah. <laughs> what did I say? We can't have um, we can't have relationships stronger than our individual relationship, than the relationship with the self. They will never go past that. Yep. Yes. And so now I want to add a complexity. Mm -hmm. What about people who tend to isolate or avoid other, and they like they and they isolate. I've seen some people who it looks like under the guise of, of doing their internal work, mm -hmm. they refuse, they reject relating to other, like they, they're, they're using it um, as, as a way to, for decades, wall themselves mm -hmm. off from other people. It feels a little bit like spiritual bypassing to me. Okay. Um, and, and I worry about it only in the realm, not about whether they want to have relationships, but I worry about whether this is a um whether it might be a way to to soothe one part of themselves but act, in fact actually hide from a, right. another layer of their internal work like it, it could be a way of it to take it into like parts work or or complex theory it could be a way to live in one part of themselves deeply connected but actually be ignoring other parts of themselves and yeah. i'm i'm curious like is there a is there a, a way to tell when you're just sort of circling around and saying, I just, I'm, I'm going to be with myself and tuned into myself and, and you forget that, that you are strong enough to, to come out and have relationships. You, like there's a transition point, right? Like now I've, mm -hmm. I've grounded in my own relationship. I I'm, I'm strong in myself. And then we, the, then we reach out and it can get messy really fast. Or mm -hmm. we reach out and we we experience a pain or a hurt or um, or a boundary violation, right? Mm -hmm. We experience an external boundary violation. What do we what do we do then? What's what's the go to move? How do we? How do well, we, we do have to come back to the self at that point. You always have to come back to the self. Um, that chronic internalization, mm -hmm. I think, is potentially a really solid trauma response. Like it's you're trying to work something out that's having a hard time being worked out. I've definitely been there at points in my life yeah. and I've been there, but I've been there consciously. I've been there like, yeah, I can't handle the external world right now. I need to heal what's going on inside. That sounds super important to me. There's a big differentiator there. Consciously. There's the yeah. consciousness of I'm going to step back from you say having romantic relationships or I'm going to step mm -hmm. back. I, I mean, I've, I've taken, I've, I've seen people take, and I've taken myself a break, a celibacy break and said, you know what, I'm going to give myself all of me for now and, and not get stuck mm -hmm. um, in that, in the, in the patterns that I'm in. But then there's the unconscious way that it right. works out sometimes. And I, that one I've had, I've had clients with this issue, but I've also had friends and family members who I've watched wall themselves off and I and I've wondered I think I've wondered but from from my position like wondered how I could help when the help really probably has to come from an internal place right they have to be ready for it of course yeah. everyone has to be ready for the next lesson if they're not ready for it, it's not going to happen yeah. you saying walled off just reminded me of an important distinction that people miss a lot and they confuse boundaries with barriers mm. Barriers are thing are walls that we put up to not connect with people, to stay isolated, to go internal and like to wall off the world. Boundaries are definitely permeable. They're ever changing, ever evolving parts of who we are. And they allow what we want in and keep out what we don't want in yeah. when we're conscious, when they're healthy, when it works. Right. And people think if I have boundaries, then I'm pushing the world away. But actually, if you have good boundaries and if you have solid relationship with your boundaries, you have better relationships. Yeah. That's a really good distinction. And from my own personal experience of myself, um, 
uh, barriers are so much simpler and they don't require <laughs> me to trust myself so much. Exactly. A boundary, I have to trust my judgment that I'm letting the right stuff through and keeping the right stuff out. And now, now, but by having them and working with them, I learn more about myself. Whereas a, a barrier, nobody learns anything. Exactly. Yeah. That was a big distinction for us early on because you were more firmly boundaried. You like there was like like this not a, not a healthy flexible yeah. um, dialectic mm -hmm. experience. Um, but I had uh, I had a high tolerance for crossing those barriers. Like I was a wall scaler. I'm like this is oh, fine. Wow. So I would violate that that wall because right. I had been trained in my childhood that my parents were going to play hard to get. And so wow. I learned to scale that wall and come and get people, which has led me to make a lot of friends and a lot of romantic relationships with people who are very aloof and distant and want mm -hmm. to be pursued. And so now I have to, I have to be ever aware of like, oh, that, that's a stance. We're creating a withdraw, withhold cycle really quickly. If I pursue, if I over pursue and I actually can find their boundaries attractive. I can, I can find myself in a place where I'm like, oh, I want somebody who's walled off, not in a healthy boundary state, not right. a, because it reminds me of my childhood and that unconscious part of me is attracted to that. So the, the level of consciousness that I have to bring mm -hmm. to my relationships in order to not just fall into that pattern is pretty intense. And I, if, I mean, we were years of me like running into that to get him, hauling him out and then and then negotiating out, but that, that didn't leave him connected to his body and actually no. didn't leave any space for me to connect to my body right? because I was so busy. So we're living in each other's systems like and, all the time. And I didn't even have the concept of boundaries like we're talking about now, right. um, which made those experiences, um, well, it was harder to learn from them because I didn't really understand what was happening. Yeah. And yeah. So you you talking about um, about personal boundaries, and I think that's what you're talking about. The boundaries, the, the barriers that I put up were as much within me to wall parts of myself off from myself as they were to block me from other people. Um, so do you find, um, so that was like my, my issue, like, okay, what are we even talking about? When you're working with people around uh, boundaries, what uh, what kinds of things tend to be tripping them up? Like, so here is mine, just not understanding that there are any. Yeah, you didn't understand, <laughs> didn't that, understand those were, that boundaries was a concept, but. Right, right. And I want to go back just a little bit to say that I don't think it's a it's wrong or bad or unhealthy to be totally walled off if you don't understand what boundaries are. Yeah. Oh. If it's like the same as consent, if it's not a solid yes, if it's not a hell yes, then it's a no right now. If you're right. not totally yeah, clear on how to engage, yeah. then it's a no and, and not engaging is healthy. So being being walled off and having really strong, hard boundaries, I don't think is a negative thing. I think it's the space where you learn. Yeah. Wow, that's really useful. In the beginning, of course, I, yeah, in the beginning of the course that I wrote, I have people very much cut a lot of things out, cut out social media, really step back from a whole bunch of things to go into that internal place. And I say, don't worry, it'll be there when you're done. It'll be there when we're done with this process and you'll know better how to engage. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I want to be careful to say that it's not a bad thing to, to be really boundaried. And your question was, where do people get tripped up by? I think it's, I, I, like I said, I think it's the somatic experience first. I think it's understanding the information from the body first. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's vocalizing. That's a whole nother step from yeah. understanding what's going on in your body. That's one step. Admitting to what's happening in your body. That's another one. And then expressing what's happening, mm -hmm. which may or may not be vocalizing. Expressing could be dance or art or any number of things, but the externalization when you know your truth and then having to go into the external part of it, that's a very challenging translation often Yeah, for all of us. I think all the time. I, mm, abs I, absolutely. And I, as a person who has, I have a high um, tolerance for verbalizing. So, f but that means that the other tools, the other ways of expressing are actually, uh, they work 
more directly with my somatic experience. Like there's, there's nothing like some blindfolded dancing to put me oh, yeah. back into, oh, oh, because the words for me come so easily that mm-hmm. they may not actually be related to my bo- embodied experience. That's I wise. Have, yeah. I have to d- like have to set that down. It's a great shield, right? But I don't, when I don't want the shield, when I want to actually connect and what I think of is like, come back to, come back to myself in a way so that I, so that I can relate to other. Cause I, I appreciate deep that you're saying like, we get, we have to get clear about who we are and how we're in our truth. And then what do we do? Like do, <laughs> when we're in a relationship already mm-hmm. and we recognize that, that we are struggling with not knowing what do we do? I mean, I mean, I think that's probably the biggest question I get from people because some people's solution is, well, I can't do anything. I can't do the boundary work because I don't want to sacrifice my relationship, but I don't think that this is an either or, and I'm guessing. No, right. Yeah. They're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, they, they support each other, but when you're, I think whenever you're having any kind of struggle in a relationship, you have to go back to the self. You have to return to the self. And we just don't know how to do that. We are just not taught that that's the go-to to return to myself. Right. To take some space, to go for a walk, to go on a vacation alone, whatever it needs to be, to get clear with your own energy, your own thought, your own vibration. Right. And once when somebody is doing that, do you have any practical ideas for how somebody might introduce the idea that they, they want to that they want to spend some time focusing on themselves yeah. in a way that isn't, um, that doesn't feel like a total cutoff, you know, yes. that maintains um, a generosity of spirit with their, with yes. their persons, their partners. That's such a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah. You do have to communicate what you're doing, that I need time for me. It's not about you. And you, you do absolutely have to communicate a, a container, a solid container, meaning like a time barrier. Like, I will talk to you next Tuesday. I need to go be with myself. I will, I will get back to you this evening. I'm going to go on this vacation, whatever you need the time container. So it doesn't trigger the abandon, the abandonment part of your partner. So you're not just running away. If your partner knows I'm going to communicate with you in five hours, I'm going to communicate with you in three days, whatever it may be, their psyche can relax around it. It's huge. And this is also where I find it's great to have to be well resourced, but you know, mm-hmm. to so I recently experienced a loss, and the thing that let me go through that loss was that I had, I had other, I had myself resources, and I had other relationships, and I could turn to them and say, "Oh, I'm going to need support for the next six weeks. I'm going to mm-hmm. need support. I know, I know, I'm going to." Um, the time container helps you know what you're asking for too, versus mm-hmm. just sort of falling apart into. I don't know what's happening Mm because we don't in general respond real well to, I don't know what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all well and good to say, live in the, say, you know, like live in the mystery, but actually living in the mystery with your partner can feel deeply abandoning and really trigger us into that spot where we're not, we're no longer behaving in integrity. I see a lot of people lash out at that point. Yeah. It's a scary place. Yeah. Yeah. So what's coming to mind now is just that this is, this is one of the ways where we can, Ken and I talk a lot about prioritizing growth over like minute to minute comfort. And Mm -hmm. so this is a great time to, to dig into that. So we're not talking about, I want you to be uncomfortable in your body. I'm saying sometimes it will be uncomfortable because your partner will need to, to take time for themselves or you will need to request time for yourself or a million other things, but, and prioritizing that, allowing yourself to be in that process is how you, how you really get into individuating as your, as your prime mover in your relationship yes. rather than enmeshment, rather yes. than we're just going to live out the cultural story and raise our 2.5 kids, get our three and a half dogs and we're good to go. <laughs> right. Um, I, I love that you've said this. So 
as we wrap up, I would love for you to tell everybody how they can find you hmm. and how they can find out about your course, because I think that this is really, really powerful work. And I want as many people as possible to take part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. Thank you. Sorry, Ken, what were you going to say? I was just agreeing. Uh, it's like I want to um, I want to require it for all my colleagues. <laughs> you know, honestly, that's why I wrote it first. So I've been doing in-person stuff for years. I've been working with people in different regards for 13 years and COVID has forced me to go online and, and digitize my work. And I got really clear that this boundary work was first because everyone needs it, including myself. I wrote it for myself and my friends and my loved ones. We all need this. And at some point I'm going to require it before doing any coaching with me. Cause it's just so foundational That's when a, I get to that level. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so my website is where you can find all the information links to social medias and that kind of thing. And then the application for the course is on the front page of the website. And that is higher sex education.com H I G H E R leveling up the game, higher sex education.com. And everything's the, on the there. The link will be in the show notes and people can always reach out to me if you want to be collect connected to Melissa. Um, I am so, so excited that you're putting this into the world in this format because you and I met in a very interesting format. We came together in a container to learn about sex ed. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was really aware of is how rare the opportunity we were having was. Like yeah. so few people were going to get a chance to sit and really feel about sex not just yeah. talk about it but feel about it and right. that was precious time and so to see you now putting that out into the world in a way that will be accessible for people who can't necessarily fly to or get to a place where it's okay to talk about these things I think this is this is game changing mm -hmm. I highly recommend it to everyone and I'm so so grateful that you are here to talk about it with us thank, thank you thank so you much. This has been really great. Thanks for having me on. I feel like we could talk for another hour. Thank you. I, I'm not saying, I feel not incomplete. Time here with us. <laughs> Plenty more conversations to have. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate Sustainable Love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.